Amen. Can't wait till church time. Praise the Lord. Colossians chapter number 3. Praise the Lord. Colossians chapter 3, verse number 17. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Trying to make it to heaven, folks. Just, just trying to make it. Trying to live a life that will be pleasing to the Lord. And trying through the teaching and preaching of the word to help you. Amen. To help you. To be able to see the plan of salvation, to be able to see that there are great things the Lord desires for us and uh, for each of us as individuals. And uh, I'm, uh, I'm really excited, really excited about what you're allowing the Lord to do in your lives. That's why you have revival in a church. It ain't because of the preacher. Right? It's because people get their minds fixed and stayed on what the Lord wants instead of what we want. That's how you have revival. And whatsoever. What does that mean? Whatsoever means everything ye do in word or deed. Do all. Everybody say all. In the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Now, i gotta let, I got to read to you the things that follow that. Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as it is fit in the Lord. Now, there's a whole, I'm not going to teach on that today, so ladies, don't get your dander up. Somebody told me one time, if you ain't getting a very good response from the church, Either preach on wives, submit yourself to your husbands, or money. You'll get a response. <laughs> wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as it is fit in the Lord. That explains itself, right? If, if it flows with what the Lord wants. Come on now. Don't be all scared. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter that word bitter means harsh toward them. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Servants, obey your masters according to the flesh, not as men-pleasers, but from the heart. Now, say, well, how does that apply to us? This would be applicable to us with regard, regard to our employment and how we should approach our job. He says, whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not as to men or not unto men. So we often think, we, even though these directives are not the focus of my message this morning, these things I just mentioned off to you are not the focus of my message. But they are simply to show you that when he says whatsoever you do in word or deed has a whole lot further reach than just going around laying hands on people and they be healed. There's more to it than just miracles, signs, and wonders. But it's not even necessarily referring to that, Brother Rice, because I am persuaded I am persuaded that in the mind of God that miracles, signs, and wonders are supposed to be a part of our everyday life. And in the mind of God, when we're filled with the Holy Ghost, Brother Pete, that the things that we do should involve miracles, signs, and wonders. He said, these signs shall follow them that believe. Okay. Whatever you do, do it to the Lord. They are to show that the initial directive in telling us that all we speak or do should be done in the name of Jesus. Everything you do. 
your home, your job, going to school, everything you do should be done in the name of Jesus. This educates us to the fact that everything we do, everything we do is a representation of Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 19. I didn't give you any scriptures. My fault, bro. I'm sorry about that. 2 Corinthians 5, 19 through 21. Somebody that's really tapped into the Holy Ghost, text my scriptures to him real fast. If that phone starts buzzing over there, I'm going to probably run out. To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. Okay. To wit that God was in Christ. Reconciling the world unto himself. Not imputing their trespasses unto them. And hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. The work that he did, he has committed unto us. And it's all about reconciliation, which is reconciling all of mankind back to God. That's the plan. That's the goal. Now then, the next scripture says, we are ambassadors. Everybody say ambassadors. Ambassadors for Christ as though God did beseech you by us. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. A word ambassador is a representative of another country's leader when in that country, the place of the ambassador's dwelling and all of his activities reflect the home country or the home leader that is represented. When I speak the name Adolf Hitler, There is generally a universal reaction, right? The name, you automatically associate the name with his actions. When I speak the name Joseph Stalin, there is a universal reaction. Likewise, when I speak the name of Gandhi, or I speak the name of Mother Teresa, the people that are good in the mainstream of society, there's also an automatic association with their names. The name Saddam Hussein would be a more contemporary illustration. As, if I, as I say that name, there's automatically a feeling of, of repulsion that would come into your mind or your heart. Biblical names such as Judas has become synonymous with the word traitor and Thomas with the word doubter and so on. The name that you carry becomes, God help me right now as I feel the Holy Ghost coming on me. The name that you carry, that you are given at birth, is not the same name you die with. Because the name you're given to you at birth is what identifies you in the hospital. The actions that you do from the day you're born to the day you die become the identity that associates with your name. Your actions. Proverbs 22 and 1 says, somebody should be able to quote this. A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches and loving favor rather than silver or gold. A good name is something we should be interested in. Whether in a community or in a school, especially in this small town setting that we have, a person is known according to the name they have made for themselves. Right? The idea or the concept of being identified with the name of the Lord began with Moses' revelation at the burning bush. Moses said, who shall I say sent me? 
And the Lord spoke to Moses from the bush and said, Tell them I am that I am hath sent you. Now, I would like to dwell on this for a few minutes, but, you know, the, 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 the sermon that we saw last Monday night declares what, that when he says I am, that means everything else is not. I am that I am as God identified himself to Moses. Now, why was that important? It was important for Moses because, remember this, Moses was raised in the house of Pharaoh. Moses was aware that in the Egypt land, when he walked down the street in the land of Egypt, everybody said, there goes Moses. And they didn't have to say, Brother David, Pharaoh's grandson. He identified with the monarchy of the house of Egypt. But then Moses killed an Egyptian who was mistreating an Israelite. And when he found out he was busted, he, he went away. And he spent 40 years on the backside of the desert. But it was important now that Moses, who identified with authority, that his entire life, his entire raising, identified with authority for him to have a name he could use which would give him the authority to speak into Pharaoh's life. There had to be a power that was represented by a name that would make Pharaoh respect what Moses had to say. Now, we got to understand this, that going in, when Moses showed up, uh, Brother McKinney, and he told Pharaoh, the Lord said, let my people go. Pharaoh said, who's that? Don't mean nothing to me. Who's that? And then with the steps of throwing the rod down and becoming a serpent and the rod that budded and all the plagues, God began to reveal himself to the people of Egypt. But it was with the the identification of the name so that when they saw the the light turn to darkness or the dust turn to to, to gnats or fleas, when they saw their cattle fall dead or the Nile turn to blood, they had to immediately recognize the God of the children of Israel, the I am is in operation. And from that day until this day, from that day until this day, the name of the Lord God Almighty carries the the ultimate power on planet earth. It doesn't matter if you believe it or not, it's the truth. Because he began to reveal himself. Think about it. I talked about this the other day. But when the children of Israel made it to the promised land, the first city they had to go through was Jericho. When they sent the two spies into Jericho and they went to the harlot's house to be hid from the authorities, Rahab said, we've heard about you people. Understand this. They didn't hear about them, Brother David, because of who they were. They heard about them because of who their God was. They heard about them because without their God, they never leave Egypt. Without their God, they stayed slaves. Without their God, Canaan stays belonging to the stranger. We, everybody say we. We who are commanded to be witnesses have also been given a name to use in witnessing and preaching the message of salvation. Luke 24 and 47 says, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Can somebody tell me what his name is? Oh, come on. His name is Jesus. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. I may preach from Genesis. uh, I may preach from Exodus. uh, I may preach from Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But whatever I preach, uh, it must be done in the name of Jesus. Not just a random name. 
Not just a name that they pulled out of the air. Not just a name to try to make somebody be chicken or scared. But a name that has been elevated above every name. Philippians chapter 2 and verse number 9 says, Wherefore God has also highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Acts 4 and 12 says, Neither is there salvation in any other for there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It's the name of Jesus that saves you. Not the name of Jesus that lived in Tyre. Not the name of Jesus that lived in Bethlehem. But Jesus Christ of Nazareth. The one that got on a tree and died for you and I. The name of Jesus. So we with boldness and with the power and the promise of the, of the promises of the word, we invoke the name of Jesus. And when we invoke the name, we're using a name that every demon recognizes. We're using a name that every disease recognizes. We're using a name that every sin recognizes. The name which is synonymous with salvation, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Now the plan is, his plan is for the name to represent him, his messengers, and his people. And it is a recurring theme throughout scripture. Ever since the burning bush, he has revealed himself according to his name. The people of that day, much as we do, recognize the importance of a name, right? This is, I hope this is a good illustration to recognize what I mean. When I, maybe Garrison's got a buddy spending the night with him. They're upstairs in their room, Brother Robbie, and they wrestling and roughhousing and beating on the roof, on the ceiling, and I'm trying to read or something, and it's disturbing me. So they're bouncing around and everything, Brother David, and I send Carly upstairs and say, tell them to stop. Okay? She's going to open the door. She's going to say, y'all need to stop. And they're going to say, kaboom, get out of here. Or else get her in a headlock and body slam her and pinch her and bite her and then run her out. But if she opens the door and says, daddy said for y'all to stop it makes a difference because no longer is she speaking from her own mind or her own disturbance, but she's. But she's speaking from the authority of the one that owns the house. Okay. Notice 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 16, Brother Shannon. Notice the message given to Solomon as the Lord instructs him with regard to the conditions of carrying on, carrying or operating under his name. Now, this is the same passage of Scripture that we like to quote it. You don't have to go back there because I'm going to quote it. They should know it. If my people which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. I will forgive their, hear, hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. And we like to, Brother Billy, we like to cut up Jack when they say that. We like to get excited and we like to clap. And if I would have hollered it out, some of y'all would have clapped if I was excited about it. Right? We just get excited about that. If my people, I love it, brother. There, there's something that makes the hair stand up on my neck, brother Pete, when I quote that scripture. But the Lord wasn't through talking. Notice what he says. I'm, I'm going to help somebody this morning. That's my desire is to help somebody. 
Notice what he says. For now have I chosen and sanctified this house. Because this conversation going on between the Lord and Solomon is concerning the temple. There's never been a permanent place. Right? There's never been a permanent place. They've, it's been a mobile tabernacle or the tabernacle of congregation, but there has never been a temple where people said, I can go there and worship the true God. Right? David desired to build it, Brother Pete, but because he had shed so much blood and because of the things that went on in his life, he was unable to. Now, I want you to see the plan here. Now, I also want you to understand, you... Folks that are just now coming to church and you're new converts and what have you, do not get discouraged about what I'm fixing to say. I want you to get this first verse before we talk about what comes after that. Okay? We got to understand, and you saints understand this too, when somebody gets filled with the Holy Ghost, uh, they will be drawn to the Lord as He draws them, not as we drive them. So if somebody ain't moving as rapidly as you think they ought to move, go to your bedroom and ask the Lord to give you patience because they're doing fine. For now have I chosen and sanctified this house. Solomon built the house, Brother Terry. It was David's plan and Solomon built it, but it was just another building. Until the Lord said, this is going to be a place where my name is. Now, there's a whole lot of intricacies that I could bring out about that, but it's very important, Brother Booby, that when people came to this temple, that they didn't have to guess who they were coming there to worship. Okay. Okay. That my name may be there forever. Ladies and gentlemen, when the name is applied to you, he means for it to stay there forever. He doesn't fill anybody with the Holy Ghost planning on them walking away. But his name is put there forever. That's why it is important, it is essential, nobody goes up to a devil and says, in the name of the Father, I cast you out. Nobody goes up to a devil and says, in the name of the Son, come out of them right now. Or even in the name of the Holy Ghost, Brother Robbie. But everybody, Trinitarians and oneness alike, will say, in the name of Jesus. Because Father, Son, and Holy Ghost ain't a name of nobody. The name was I am, Elohim, El Shaddai, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Nisi, until he was born in Bethlehem of Judea, and it was Jehovah Savior, which is Jesus Christ. But Brother Petey put a name there. A name that represented who he was. And it was for a people that were called by his name. That my name may be there forever. Now before I go any further. And I like to flow in the Holy Ghost and I'm feeling it right now. But I don't want you to miss out on what I'm saying. I don't want you to be confused about what I'm saying. They built the temple. They offered sacrifices, asked the Lord to come in, and he did. And when he came in, he said, I've chosen to have my name here. Now, there's a tie in here, and I'm not going to get it. But Jesus Christ said, you've not chosen me, I've chosen you. But that's what happens when we lift our hands and make a decision to follow him, to believe on him, to receive him, as soon as he takes, boy, as soon as he comes in, 
He stands up and said, this is my house. No longer do you belong to you, but if I'm going to be here, they might call you Terry, but when I look at you, I see Jesus. We identify with him. We are his children. We are filled with his spirit. And mine eyes and mine heart shall be there perpetually. Somebody want to tell me what perpetually means? Always without end. Now here's what you got to get before I go any further. You got to let the devil know the name has been applied to me. Now I might be making some mistakes and I might be having a little bit of a struggle and I may be going through some trials, but I want to let you know I don't belong to you. I don't belong to you. I belong to the Lord. And me and him are getting my junk together. Y'all got to remember now. Y'all got to remember. The prodigal never made it home by himself. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost right now. My goodness. He never made it all the way home by himself. But the Bible said his father saw him coming. No, not yet. A great way off. Well, I got goosebumps on my cheeks right now. Yes, sir. Sure. The name is Jehovah. Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Shalom, Jehovah God. There's just one God. Oh, my God, have mercy. That's why I can't preach nothing else. I can't preach nothing else, but you're going to be saved. You've got to be baptized in the only saving name there is. That's when the name is applied. That's when the old carcass uh, is buried. And here we go. Next verse. And as for thee, I knew he was going to get around to me in a minute. He said, my name's going to be here forever, perpetually. That's the plan. It's for me and you to stay together forever. But as for thee, if thou wilt walk before me as David thy father walked. Now, we know David wasn't sinless. Right? David could be a scallywag. Huh? David made some terrible mistakes. Not just the big one. The big one we know about is him peeping Tom. That's what he was. He's checking out somebody else's wife, taking a bath. Lust got in his heart. He called her over to his house. Commits adultery. He's the man after God's own heart. Chosen by God to be that defined as that. David didn't live a, 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 a life completely free of mess ups and mistakes and just downright foolishness. But there was something about David. When the man of God said, you got some junk in your life. You got some wrong in your life. You got some problems. Immediately, David didn't question the man of God. He fell on his face and said, have mercy upon me, O God. Well, I could talk about killing the giant. And Dave, Brother David, David wasn't the only giant killer in Scripture. It happened some more. I could talk about killing the giant. I can talk about killing the lion and killing the bear and being anointed as a young man. But I come to tell you that the defining factor of David's life was not all his mighty accomplishments, but it was his super fast quickness to repent of his sins when it had been pointed out to him. 
Ladies and gentlemen, that's how we're going to be successful in living for God is when the Spirit speaks into our life, the Word speaks into our life, our first response is not one of anger, not one of why you picking on me, but it is have mercy upon me, O oh God. If, if thou will walk before me as David thy father walked and do according to all that I have commanded thee and shall observe my statutes and my judgments. Next verse. Then will I establish the throne of thy kingdom according as I have covenanted with David thy father saying, there shall not fail thee a man to be ruler in Israel. But if you turn away and forsake my statutes and my commandments which I have set before you and shall go and serve other gods and worship them. Next verse. Then will I pluck them up by the roots out of my land which I have given them. And this house which I have sanctified for my name will I cast out of my sight and will make it to be a proverb. Now think about this just for a minute. And a byword among all nations. So that when they talk about the temple, they will not talk about its glory but they will talk about its fall because I put my name there and if you begin to misrepresent me and this house that you're so proud of which is high, shall be astonishment to everyone that passeth by it, so that he shall say, Why hath the Lord done thus and thus unto this land and to this house? And it shall be answered, Because they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, which brought them forth out of the land of Egypt, and laid hold on other gods, and worshipped them, and served them. Therefore he brought all this evil upon them. The reason I read you that is to let you know there are conditions to carry in the name of Jesus. There are conditions to speaking or operating in the name. I'm afraid that we don't fully comprehend the far-reaching power and effects of using the name or of carrying the name or of living under the name that's above every name. So the question that we must now ask ourselves is, can I do what I'm doing? Can I live how I'm living? Can I speak like I'm speaking and still represent the name of Jesus? Whatsoever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of Jesus. There are many folks, now you hear me right now, there are many folks Listen, I ain't scared. I'm not a bit scared. After I preached the way I did last Sunday night, Miss Francis still got the Holy Ghost, I ain't worried about it no more. This is God's church. He tells me to say what, I, what he wants me to say. I'm going to say it, and then he's going to move. But I got to help you. And I got, there are people among us in the religious world, in the world of Christendom, which means all that aspire to the Christian ethic, not all that are Christians, but all they claim to be. That like to wear the name of Jesus when it's fitting and take it off when they want to get away. It, it don't demonstrate it nowhere. I've told this before. It don't demonstrate itself nowhere better than on silly old Facebook. They'll copy and paste the Jesus loves you scripture and then cuss in their next post. Okay, I'm not damning and condemning them. I'm just telling you, when you carry the name of Jesus, you don't talk like that. You don't act like that. Now understand this, we, we make mistakes. 
Okay, you've got to understand that there's a difference between people messing up and making mistakes and trying to get to God and people that thumb their nose at him. I don't know how it's going to work either. I didn't want to preach this. There's a scripture. Oh, you please y'all stay with me. I'm still in revival. People are still getting the Holy Ghost. But y'all don't want a pastor that'll stand up here holding the Bible, smiling from ear to ear, saying, you're doing a good job if you ain't. Huh? We, the Bible is full of directives. And Paul even told them, am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? I hadn't made it yet. And every message, Brother Mark, every message I preached here, I done preached it to myself. There's a scripture in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 16, Brother Shannon, that has always caught my attention. I love Hebrews chapter 11. How many of you love Hebrews chapter 11? It's a beautiful chapter. It shares a portion of the life story, or in, in some cases it shares the defining moment in the lives of those that chose to follow God, regardless of what they saw around them presently or what had happened in their past. Can I say that one more time? It is the portion of the life story, or in many cases, Brother Billy, it's that it tells the defining moment in the lives of those that chose to follow God regardless of what they were going in through right that minute or of what had happened in their past. Because everyone that is identified in Hebrews chapter 11 is not identified by their reality, they are identified by their faith. And faith is always ahead of us. If you believe that your child is going to be healed, you pray the prayer of faith on them and they are healed. No longer is that faith, but it has become knowledge. It is a fact. And that builds your faith to pray for them the next time. But we're always believing and pushing and going forward. They, by faith, look to a brighter tomorrow. By faith in God, they lived, spoke, breathed, preached faith. Abraham. He rose up by faith, left his homeland, left his family, and went to a place that God had told him about. Strictly by faith. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 16. But now they desire a better country. That is a heavenly country. Wherefore God, stay with me right now, Sometimes I pray this, Brother Pete. Lord, I don't want you to be ashamed of me. Now, I'm going to give you a story in my own life that proves exactly what I'm saying to you. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. What they looked for, he has prepared them. Another passage says, they look for a city which hath foundations in this same chapter whose builder and maker is God. We baptize in Jesus' name. We lay on of hands in Jesus' name. In emergencies and in times of crisis, uh, we are quick, quick to cry out the name of Jesus. I don't know about you all, but if I know my kids are on the road and I hear about a wreck or I hear about the police coming down, immediately... In the name of Jesus, 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 Jesus. Protect my family, protect my kids, protect my wife. Immediately. In a city of a million people, I still think it can be mine. And then when I find out it's not, I begin to pray in the name of Jesus, 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 help those who it is. Because I believe there's power in the name of Jesus. And when there's an emergency comes against you and you don't have time to think immediately, we speak the name of Jesus. But how about in our marriage? How about in our hobbies, in our habits? How about in the workplace? How about in the schoolyard? 
I got to tell you a funny story. I don't want nobody to get mad at me, think less of me. I was 14 years old when this happened. Before I ain't going to tell it now if anybody's going to get mad at me. Y'all promise not to? That's 26 years ago. All right? Been a lot of water going to the bridge. I'm ashamed of it. Y'all going to laugh at me. Y'all going to laugh at me because I was a dummy, but I'm ashamed of it. I went to it with a buddy of mine to a church of another faith. I was 14, which is way old enough to know better. If I would have been caught, I would have been thrashed. I went to a lock-in at a church of another faith with a friend of mine. He and I was bored with what they were doing. So we snuck away from the group and went into the church house. into their sanctuary. Well, we found out how to turn the PA system on, and we got in the microphone, and we started singing. Now, this is going to make y'all laugh, too. My redneck self, country is cornbread. We started singing songs and rapping. And I didn't know a whole lot of rap stuff because a lot of them was nasty and I might have been messing up, but I wasn't messing up all that bad. But I used to listen to a rap group called the Fat Boys when I was with my buddy because I wasn't allowed to have such as that. Mac is going to be trying out for the Fat Boys pretty soon. So we were up there, didn't, wasn't cursing or nothing like that. But we were just singing and rapping. Wasn't nobody in the church but me and him. The fellowship hall was like right over there by where Brother Zip is. It's shaped like this. Well, we got tired after a while, got hoarse. My part, my main part was because I didn't know any, any words very much. But I still was doing it. I was cool as all get out too. Huh? <laughs> and that this, don't forget my story. Wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God. Okay? I never did tell daddy this either. So you don't tell him, Lord. I don't want him to know about this because it was dumb. Well, this guy with a great big red beard, it was a visiting group that were there providing the entertainment. Well, me and my buddy, we, we come be bopping out of the church back into the fellowship hall. And Brother Pete, he called us as we come in. And he said, I need to talk to y'all. He said, while you was out in that church house singing and rapping, there was one of our young ladies in the choir loft praying. And she heard you. Oh, man. Well, then he commenced to trying to save us wayward teenagers. Okay. You know, he's going to try to witness to us and save us because he was doing the right thing. And I, I mean, I appreciate what he was trying to do. So he starts telling me about what this to do to be saved and stuff. I don't remember everything he said because I couldn't wait to say, hold on a minute. My daddy is a Pentecostal preacher. <laughs> and I know everything you need to know about being saved. And right that minute, daddy would have been so proud to have been standing there beside me as I come out of a church rapping and singing worldly songs and bragging how my daddy was a preacher. <laughs> Can y'all see me? I was going to correct him. And, I mean, Brother Pete, I really thought, boy, I'd just tell him. Daddy would have been thrilled to death and proud that I'm standing there after doing something stupid and wrong, bragging. I'm, I'm Pentecost. You can't tell me nothing. I bet the guy was thinking, I knew them Pentecost folks was nuts. <laughs> but we do things, say things, act certain ways, and then when we get to feeling a little spiritual, we want to go tell somebody, Let, can, can I invite you to come go to church with me? Is, is the way we're living 
a way that when Jesus and the angels get together, he'll say, have you considered my servant, Marcus? Is he going to bring our name up with pride that we carry his name in a manner that truly reflects him? Or does he sit on his throne and hide his face? Is he ashamed to be called my God? And the shame, Brother Billy, will never rest with him. But it rests with me. Is my behavior indicative of somebody? If we keep in our mind that we with our lives, with our actions, with our habits with the look on our face, how we treat our husband or our wife, how we treat our children, how diligent we work on our job site. It's not necessarily about all this terrible sinning that we go do, but if we work hard, we're representing Jesus. If we speak nice to our children, we're representing Jesus. If we speak nice and friendly to the poor little old waitress that brings us burnt half-done food and brings us tea when we order Coke, When you eat, you represent Jesus. When you go to sleep, you represent Jesus. Amen. When you go to the shopping mall, you represent Jesus. Amen. On the job, you represent Jesus. In school, you represent Jesus. And he plans on you representing him forever. The plan is to be there perpetually. The plan is to be there forever. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, you will either do it in the name of Jesus or you won't. There's no win between. Huh? Hallelujah. We have got to learn that we reflect him. We represent him in all our words. Nobody has much trouble doing that at church. But it's when we leave the church house we got to remember we're still representing him because I'm preaching a message that says people's lives are changed. I'm preaching a message that says when the Holy Ghost gets on you, you're delivered, you're set free, you're not bound anymore, that if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. So we must be very careful. We understand there's a dividing line between making mistakes and growing in Christ, growing in Jesus Christ. And... Living a life totally misrepresenting who Jesus is. Is he proud of me? Can I at the end of my days say I fought a good fight? I've kept the faith. I've finished my course. Or is he a God that's ashamed of me? Let's stand. He has chosen for his name to be here. Because I repented of my sins. I believed in the word of God. I was baptized in his name. He is chosen. But I must continue to pursue him, to follow him, to live a life that's pleasing unto him. He and I are in a covenant. But a covenant is agreement by two parties. That's why I believe in grace and I love grace and I preach grace. But the Bible says, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. We must present our bodies as living sacrifices, holy, acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service. We submit ourselves to him. And when we submit ourselves to him, we will obey the word of God, the man of God, and the spirit of God. We will live a life that is reflective of him, that is representative of him. And when we begin to live a life that's representative of him, that's when the Lord begins to heal when we lay on hands. That's when the Lord begins to deliver. That's when we begin to pray through people in the grocery store. Is when we're fully representative of the name of Jesus. The name that's above every name. The name... That demons tremble at that name. It's our responsibility, not his. 
but it's our responsibility. Remember the seven dummies? The seven big dummies in the book of Acts? That they found a man possessed of the devils? And they said, we adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preached. And the devil said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? It's our responsibility to make sure that we're identified, not just by those around us, but by those in heaven and those in hell that we are representing. We are ambassadors for Jesus Christ. Jesus wants to use you. Jesus wants to change you. He wants to make you different. He wants to make you stand out. He wants to work through you. For now have I chosen for my name to be there. Whether my name stays there or not is totally dependent upon you. Whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all. Do all in the name of Jesus. There's an old, old song. It's built upon scripture. But the old song says you're the only.